Jason? I'm like, I'm supposed to be recording. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh no. <laughs> you want to do yeah. it again? Oh, we, we don't have to. It's okay. No. They'll, they'll get the gist of it um, when we put it on the YouTube channel. And we <laughs> also have my co-host, Andrika Thomas. Andrika, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. Good evening or good night, depending on where you are. I am Andrika Thomas. I am currently a project manager for pediatric oncology, and I am the creative director for Black Women in Clinical Research. Thank you so much, ladies. And we're going to get started with having our ho our speakers introduce themselves. Jason, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you again for inviting me, Danielle. Shout out to CAU props, uh, old classmates. Um, I'm Jason Carey, an MSL at Grail Inc. Um, I work in the molecular diagnostic space in oncology, where we're developing a blood test to detect over 50 types of cancers. Thank you, Jason. And we also have our other speaker, Keisha. You're on mute. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me, Danielle. And thank you for telling me about this, Jason. My name is Keisha Scarlett. I'm also a Clark Atlanta University alumna, graduated in 2007. I currently work for Teva Pharmaceuticals in their oncology, rheumatology, therapeutic area as an MSL. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to go back with the mission of Black Women in Clinical Research. The mission of Black Women in Clinical Research is to educate, empower, support, and help Black women thrive in the clinical research industry. Today, we are going to be discussing medical science liaison. I know a lot of times in the clinical research industry, there's so many different titles, but a lot of times if you don't actually have a conversation with someone that's in that position, you don't always know what those responsibilities are for those positions. So tonight we're gonna to dive in and talk about what is an MSL. So Jason, if you would like to start us off. Yeah, um, definitely. And that is a great question. And I'll start off by saying I never wanted to be an MSL, ironically. In fact, I fought it for a very long time. So I finished my PhD at Clark Atlanta and I spent eight years at MD Anderson doing laboratory research. Um, but an MSL is essentially a purveyor of information. And that's the way we view our role. We're really the educators for typically medical affairs. And in terms of the day-to-day -day roles, it can be anything from uh, speaking to physicians about the, uh, about the technology. In my case, I'm in molecular diagnostic, how an assay works, the implication for patients, clinical studies, and so on. So essentially looking at an MSL, you play an educational role, but at the pharmaceutical biotech level and what you have, what you do has extreme importance to the company. But beyond that, you're also responsible for bringing insights. So that's bringing insights into the company from outside, but also taking those insights from within the company and, and uh, properly conveying them to the appropriate audiences. Okay. Thank you so much, Jason. Keisha, would you like to give your uh, definition of what is an MSL also? Yeah, I think Jason hit on two key words, inside, outside, right? So liaison, you really are the middleman for your company and they rely on you quite a bit. So as he mentioned, you're that internal educator. So you're bringing insights from the field. So discussions you may have with physicians, with nurses, it kind of just depends on the space you work in. And you're bringing that back to your company and you're educating them about what the needs are in the medical community that you're kind of a part of, right? But then on the other end, you're taking data from clinical studies that maybe your company or maybe some other um, group is working on that relates to those um, drugs and products that your physicians and your network are using. And you're taking that information, you're externally sharing it with people in the field so you really are that middleman. You're educating both internally with your own colleagues um, and externally with people in the medical community. And we often call people in the medical community in our field um, HCPs or healthcare providers. You'll hear people refer to them as KOLs, which are key opinion leaders. Not my company in particular. We call them EEs or external experts. So a lot of acronyms, of course, which we're used to as scientists, right? Right. I'm and about I'll to say. 
Oh, sorry. And I'll also add to what Keisha said. One thing I forgot to say is the MSL is just one title, but the role can vary widely depending on the company, depending on the stage of of the product that you're working on. So, you know, if I'm working on an established product, my role may be different versus if we're just launching a new product. If I'm working for a small company that's just starting out as a biotech, the role may be different where you're trying to do everything to get that product to launch versus being in a more established company. But you also have MSLs that are like biotech, molecular diagnostics, uh, big pharma, small pharma. There's also the MSLs that are part of health, econo uh, health economics outcomes research. And then you also have payer MSLs. So there essentially there are a lot of different roles just within that one title. Wow. Yes, you guys have touched on a lot. And within the industry, there's always those acronyms. And I feel like you have to learn them all because you can't really have a conversation with anyone if you don't know it because you're like, what are they talking about? So you guys really already touched on the responsibilities of a MSL. But if someone was interested in entering um, or becoming a MSL, how do you enter in this field without experience? I'll let you go first this time, Keisha. Um, I will say it's incredibly difficult and it takes persistence and I would say it takes networking. So, um, I can tell you, I have friends who are MSLs who, um, they may say they got lucky and they just applied, um, very rigorously, sometimes for months on end. It took me over a year to get my first MSL position. And what I did is I networked, um, online through LinkedIn so I would reach out to people who are MSLs. I would ask them for informational interviews, which is usually just 10 minutes maximum of their time, asking them, hey, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? This is who I am, and this is what I'm interested in doing. One of those people who I had an informational interview with was actually also a Clark Atlanta alumna, and she was a manager at a pharma company, and she ended up giving me my first um, MSL opportunity um, to interview and I ended up getting that position. So I will never um, underscore, I will always um, underscore the importance of networking. Even electronically, you would be surprised the response that you get from people. Some people won't respond, but some people will give you their time. And to me, that has been the, be the most beneficial um, thing in terms of launching my career in this space. Definitely. Jason. No. So I'll follow it up. I remember when I finally decided to take the leap and become an MSL and Keisha had recently become an MSL. So I reached out to Keisha and I asked her some of, you know, essentially what she's talking about, which is networking, finding out what do you do in the role? A lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight, like what does the role entail? How do you get that experience? Where should I start off? And so that was a great example where I leveraged my network but to your question, how do you enter the field without experience? Keisha said something uh, very interesting right there. And I think all of us in the MFL field uh, essentially feel like we're lucky to be in the position. Uh, and I, that's what I tell people. I tell people I got lucky, but what people don't know is what I consider luck is luck is equal parts opportunity and preparation. So essentially you have to prepare yourself, but those opportunities have to come about like Tonight, listening to MSLs, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for you to hear somebody in the field and take as many notes or get as many points as you want. The other part is, uh, Keisha touched on a, a real point in terms of it's very hard to get into the position without experience. However, what I typically tell people when they reach out to me is you have to be qualified. So you may not have the MSL experience, but what I try to tell people is try to paint yourself as if you, what you've been doing or anything you can think of that is already an MSL. So paint yourself when you go for that interview that you are, you've already been an MSL without the title. So that means knowing that you're an educator, knowing like therapeutic products, knowing that you know how to evaluate papers and how to bring insights or that you've worked with KOLs. Because if essentially when somebody wants to hire you for the first time to be an MSL, they, they want to think that they got you at a bargain, right? Because getting an MSL with experience will be essentially expensive, but they, they want to feel like they got somebody who was always an MSL or destined to be an MSL. They just didn't have that title. So your opportunity to get there is to leverage yourself as, well, I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I've been doing all these other things. And essentially, 
I'm just ready to make it official. Yeah. And, and if I could add something to what Jason said, because that's really great. I think that a lot of times, um, especially if we've been working in academia, if we've been working in the lab, we box ourselves in, right? So I might be a prostate cancer research, but you have to learn the language of the field that you're trying to enter. So very early on, people were like, you need to put oncologists on your LinkedIn. Like no one cares about cancer research and industry. You have to use these buzzwords, right? A lot of you who are at Clark Atlanta, maybe you work in the cancer therapeutic, um, the prostate cancer center. If you're working in oncology, you understand in immunology. There are so many MSL positions that are based on immunology, rheumatology, which is essentially immunology based. So use those buzzwords. Don't box yourself in, leverage yourself. If you understand cancer research, you understand immunology. A lot of times you may be doing cardiovascular research. So you understand um, angiogenesis that plays into cancer. Try to find those connections that make you marketable and dig deep, like Jason was saying, in order to market yourself. Um, and at the end of the day, even if you're a student, if you've gone to conferences, if you presented posters, you are an educator, you've worked with KOLs, you've interacted with scientists, you've presented to them. So really um, be creative. I'm not saying lie because these are, these are skills that you pick up as an academic, academic scientist, but I think it's sometimes hard for us to communicate that. And that's where talking to other MSLs really comes into play and they'll help pull that out of you and frame that for you as well. Thank you, Keisha. That's really important. I know we drive that a lot in Black women in clinical research, those buzzwords and knowing, you know, if you say these type of words to recruiters or anyone that they automatically know, okay, this person is skilled to do this job. And we also talk about having those transferable skills. A lot of times, even if you don't have that direct experience, if you can show these are the skills that I've acquired from my previous position and I can apply it to this position. It makes you a more attractive candidate. So a lot of times, you know, with MSL, what are the skills that are, we, well, we kind of talked about it, but if you wanted to elaborate more on what are the skills that are needed um, or really necessary for someone to be an MSL? So I'll, I'll take this one uh, first. And um Keisha uh, talked about something that I know we both uh, were very good at, which is presenting. And I tell people the number one skill or aspect of all of my training, so undergrad, graduate, the number one aspect that allows me to be a good MSL is my ability to present data. So when I was doing poster presentations, oral presentations, I happened to win a couple of those that is probably more useful than your degree because there will be a there will be a lot of people who have phds pharmds that are genetic counselors everybody has a degree at this level so the question is how have you separated yourself and you know papers are good but truthfully for the msl field papers show that you can synthesize information but being able to present the information is a lot more important often in this role than that ability to just write the papers or understand the paper I agree. Um, nobody has ever asked about my publication record in an interview ever. They've never brought it up. They've never um, touched on it. But to my understanding, every company that you interview with will have some sort of what they call a qualification aspect of their interview where they will ask you to do a presentation. And usually it's on one of their products. And sometimes it will be with very short preparation time because they want to see, again, how you synthesize data, how you communicate that data, and can you do it in a very quick turnaround time. So your public speaking skills, your ability to connect to the audience, your ability to break down complex data in an understandable way to people who may be seeing it for the first time is very important. And quite honestly, sometimes you've seen it for the first time, maybe just you know, a week or so before, especially when you're preparing for these interviews. So that it's a really important skill to have to be able to um, speak publicly, present to, I presented to, you know, two people, four people on Zoom. I presented to an auditorium full of people, you know, at a university. So it, it varies. So definitely, um, 
I guess definitely in this industry, being comfortable with speaking and engaging um, in conversations with people and being quick on your feet. It sounds like that's definitely necessary in the MSL role. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my co-host, Rashida. Um, Thank you. Before, before we continue, Rashida, I just want to say something. And this is for all the introverts out there. And quite frankly, I consider myself an introvert, but I'm an MSL. And often people think I'm an introvert, so I can't be an MSL. That's the difference is once you have that opportunity, you have to every day when I wake up every time before a presentation, I still get nerves, butterflies and all that. And but I have to fight that down because I'm here to do a job, but not just do a job. The way I look at it in my role, we're delivering a new technology that will allow doctors to diagnose patients at much earlier stages in cancer. If I suck at my job, there are potentially patients out there who may not get a cancer diagnosis until much later because I couldn't convince a doctor that the technology is worth his effort. And, and quite frankly, you know, this is where you reach the practical realm. I worked at, you know, MD Anderson, one of the greatest institutions, worked on great science. But once you reach the practical realm, uh, it doesn't really matter how good your science, your technology is if you can't convince somebody to use it. So that's why the MSL role is so important. Yeah, and I, I will say some, you know, pharma sometimes, well, a lot of times gets a bad rap, right? But what I love about being an MSL and working in the medical affairs division, you do get a lot of talk about the patients. How can we benefit the patients? And as Jason said, you um, kind of fumbling something, maybe a question that comes your way, maybe a presentation it can ultimately impact the patient. I mean, I get questions sometimes that are flat out, hey, I'm about to treat a patient with X, Y, and Z. What do I do? What dosage do you recommend? What order of? So that is direct patient impact. Um, So coming from being a bench scientist, it's really fulfilling to be in this role and be a little bit further up the pipeline and impact patient care. But again, it comes with a huge responsibility as well. Yeah, I think it is really important to make sure, even in any aspect in clinical research roles, are to remember why you're doing it and why everything that we are a part of is important. And Jason, I'm going to touch a little bit on what you said in being an introvert. And I actually consider myself an introvert as well. Uh, and, you know, I was a CRA for a very long time, and you really have to pull yourself out of your own shell and just really hit it and understand that you have a skill set that they wanted because they recognized it in you, right? And so you have to show everyone that you are the person for this job. Um, and with all of my years in clinical research, I've been on the site side, CRO side, I've actually never gotten in contact with an MSL. So I don't I, like this is very good information for me to have, you know, to, for me to kind of tell people about the role. But I'm curious what your everyday life is as, as an MSL. Like, what does your day to day look like? And Keisha, I'll let you go. Sure. So um, things have been a little bit different, right, because of COVID. So we are typically a field-based position. So usually you're assigned a small territory or in my case, a large territory. I cover half the country, <laughs> the whole East Coast. Um, but since, since we've been kind of locked down and things are starting to open up, um, typically my day may consist of um, kind of fine tuning my list of external networks. So physicians, nurses, pharmacists are a big target for me and doing outreach. Hey, can I get an introductory meeting with you? Um, This is a product that I think is relevant to what you do. I just wanna make you aware of perhaps a new study, right? So that's that's me trying to network and build my network. I may also reach back to people that I've talked to in the past just to check up on them. They may have had a specific question about a patient There is a lot of internal work and projects as well. So I've had projects related to um, communicating with the FDA, um, market analysis. And again, this can vary from company to company what your job is. Um, I think we're getting ready to um, train internal sales force people and do education for them. So those are my colleagues, but on a different team who again need education. 
uh, a lot of conference coverage. So in my space, this is a very busy time for conferences. And again, as Jason touched on, you want to bring those insights back to your company, right? So I will attend conferences. I'll see what the new research is, the new data. I'll even look at what competitor companies are doing. And I have to generate reports and bring that back to my company. So I would say my day is one of the skills of being an MSL is being self-organized and self-driven. And my day consists of organizing myself to both reach out and engage externally, but fulfilling those projects internally. And those internal projects tend to change pretty rapidly from week to week. Oh, that is so interesting. Jason, what about you? What's your day-to-day -day look like these days? Yeah, and so, I mean, Keisha touched on a point, a great point. So I became an MSL a week before COVID. So actually my first MSL role, and then I switched to the, the company that I'm at now last December. But so I am essentially a COVID MSL. So it's been a lot of virtual work and now we're just opening up, we're doing in-person engagement, but this goes back to the type of company you work for or the therapeutic area you work in or the size of the company. So I work for a smaller company and we literally just launched our first product in the past couple of weeks. And so, our, as you can imagine, the role shift where you're getting ready for launch. So you're you know, either making sure you have all the education materials, doing all the front work to launch. But then once you launch, it's like all hands on deck, educating the sales team. So, for, so to Keisha's point, there, there are two things. It can change, it's definitely different from day to day, but it can change at a moment's notice because you might have a fire drill and there's something that you gotta handle. Or, oh, but as an MSL, so I'm responsible for Texas, Oklahoma and New Mexico, that's my territory. So anything that happens in my territory is my responsibility. I'm supposed to know the important influences or key opinion leaders in that territory, know what they're doing, one of the biggest oncology conferences just happened a weekend before last. So I need to know, to Keisha's point, everything we did, everything my competitor, everything our competitors did, uh, have done, but also just bring those insights back and disseminate them. But that's everything that you do on the outside of the company. But Keisha touched on another good point is that we're also responsible for the inside aspects of the company. And that can be, I sit on several subcommittees. So I work on competitive intelligence, so I have to know uh, everything that's going on from a competitive standpoint. I work on our publication side. And so being a part of the publications group, that's very important as an MSL because essentially everything that we do is comes through our publication. So we're not out there just giving either unpublished or um, unpresented uh, data out there. So whatever we publish essentially becomes our Bible for what... Uh, is developed in our presentations or what we can say to physicians. Okay, so it sounds like you're, you organize, you research external uh, companies and products and people, and then you research internal, and then you present a lot of information. Yeah. Y'all are busy I, all the time, huh? You're busy all the time, but uh, I will say I have the best, uh, I have the best work-life balance than I had, and I spent like eight years uh, in post PhD in academia. And that honestly was a part of the reason I left the MSL, uh, left the academic role, because I remember um, I worked crazy hours in the lab every day, killing myself to do research. And I thought I wanted my own lab, but I remember it was the night before my wife had a doctor's appointment. She was pregnant at the time. And I'm in the lab till two, three o'clock in the morning because I wanted to be there for the doctor's appointment. And so after I realized I'm, I'm killing myself, you know, essentially for nothing paid, but then at the same time, um, you can be replaced at any moment. And I wanted to have a job with more purpose. And that's kind of what made me seek the MSL position is because I needed a, I needed a, a change in my own, and I will say, even though we may think that being an MSL may be busy or you may strive, you may have to travel a lot, depending on the company you work for, the travel may be quite manageable one or two days a week. But I will say me personally, I have the greatest work-life balance than I've had since undergrad when I could, you know, roll out of bed at 10 o'clock, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that is extremely important. <laughs> will say as as hard and tough as it gets sometimes even on my busiest days you couldn't pay me to go back to the lab versus what I do now yeah wow 
Yeah, so both of you mentioned lab work. Are there, and, and Jason, earlier you mentioned um, PhDs and some pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical uh, degrees. What is like the minimum that you've, you've seen in your, in your role that people like to see? Like, is there some kind of certification you need on top of the PhD? Or is it literally just having those years of research experience in one particular area? No, so I, I will say, so I spent a lot of time doing research and, and I'll start this off, Keisha, I'll, I'll let you continue. Yeah. But um, I did the, all of the years of research because of me. And, and I'll say this again, I really didn't want to be Amazon because I thought there was so much travel. I didn't want to be away from like, you know, my family and that sort of stuff at first. So the amount of research experience I had was a me thing. A lot of people I know have gone into MF cell position, you know, one or two years after the PhD. It's kind of hard to get it straight out of grad school. I also know PharmDs, but you can have a lot, uh, several uh, graduate degrees that lead you to MF cell position. I've worked with, I work presently with PhDs, um, MDs, PharmDs, genetic counselors, and so on. Uh, but I think there's opportunity, especially if you've been in the clinical realm, um, you're not, you're not essentially ruled out. Even, uh, I've, I've known some individuals that have like master's level experience that were able to make that transition. That's more difficult. So I won't say that that's, uh, the norm, but in terms of getting certification, uh, and that's the number one question I get, do you need certification? Do you need an MSL certification to do it? Uh, I'll be honest with you. A lot of these certifications are relatively new. Um, I've helped uh, I've helped about a half a dozen people over the past year get into MSL position. None of them have certifications. Now I'm not saying a certification won't help you. The way I view it as a certification will uh, essentially, if you have no experience, it's a great opportunity to educate yourself, to get you in the frame of mind of what it takes to be an MSL and how to get to that starting A position. But just like with any job, you can have all of the theory um, there, but you get you, it'll be on the job training that really makes or break you as an MSL. So yeah. it, it's, it's not my, my overall goal, my overall uh, view of the certification. Some people may need it, like they may be pivoting from a totally different field, and that's a great way to show that they're serious about being an MSL. And Kishi, what about you and your experience? Do you, have you seen people have MSL certifications or any other common certifications that you see? Yeah, I don't want to um, speak negatively about certifications because I just don't know enough about them. I've had a few friends who work in different spaces who have mentioned them, but I think they, they become irrelevant even after you first, you get your first role. Um, so it wouldn't be relevant to me. As far as people who are trying to break into the role, I always caution them about spending money um, in order to advance their career. Um, so a lot of times these certifications may cost money. There are people out there who offer like networking services that charge a lot of money that say they can get you your first role. I fell for one of those, cost me hundreds of dollars wasn't super beneficial. Um, one thing I did pay for was um, like resume, right? A resume writing service that was beneficial. But yeah, the certifications, I just don't know much about them. I would say it's more beneficial to network with somebody in the space, have them look at your resume for free. I've done that for people. I, I'll send out, if I feel they're trustworthy, I'll send them my resume and say, hey, you can kind of frame yours off of mine and I'll send them like my early resume from when, you know, I was finishing up my postdoc and how I kind of framed myself. So I always tell people, um, try to find alternatives to paying for something because usually you're a postdoc, you're a PhD student, you don't have a lot of money anyways. And, you know, we got to be creative and we got to help each other out. So, you know, Jason said he's helped people I've helped people, even though my company personally has been essentially on a hiring freeze for most of the pandemic, just because I can't get you a position where I am, I will still share resources with you so that you can go out and kind of present yourself in the best way possible. So I always say just, you know, seek your network, leverage your network um, before you spend hundreds of dollars. 
Yeah, that's key. Networking, I think, has paid off much greater for, for most people than getting a skill. And I, and I too caution people from spending a lot of money on something when you can really find the information out for yourself and then find somebody who's in that role and then really polish your skill set and what you need for that that way. Um, so we recently learned about the MSL Society. Oh, yeah, Jason. So no, um, uh, all I was going to say was that in terms of preparing for the role. Uh, you hear us talk about key opinion leaders, which are just important people, right? When you become an MSL, it's doctors. Doctors are important people. Maybe it might be an executive at a hospital or a healthcare system that is not an MD, but they're still just as important. Uh, but key opinion leaders, that's important. If you're trying to break into the MSL role, current MSLs are your key opinion leaders. So your practice on how to engage MSLs is how you engage current MS, uh, on how you engage key opinion leaders is how you engage current MSLs. And you know, some people may get discouraged. You know, I, I know I, I know I, I get a lot of emails a lot of time from people, you know, hey, can I help? Can I get to know you? And uh, sometimes I don't respond. I try my best to respond, but quite frankly, it's just I'm so busy. So yeah. don't get discouraged if somebody isn't, you know, responding, but you can follow them on LinkedIn. If they're, you know, messaging about something, if they're sharing something about their company, hey, read it, write a, a note in the comments, that makes them remember you. So even though that you may not have, that's a way you build up a report, you know, so that second go around when you want to get a meeting with them, they remember, hey, this person did take the time, you know, to engage me at that level. So I may be more receptive, you know, out of the 10 requests for phone conversations, I may be more interested in, you know, talking with uh, this person to help them out. That's great advice. And I second all of that because we are all busy and I don't check LinkedIn all the time, but having someone, you know, comment under my post, I, I start recognizing their names and then their faces. Um, so within clinical research, we have SOCRA and then we have ACRP. And then I just found out about um, the MSL Society. Um, are either of you part of that organization? And can you kind of tell us more about how that has helped you or, or if that's something that you would consider? You can go first, Keish. Yeah, I'm, I have engaged with them. Like I follow them on LinkedIn, but to be honest, I'm not an active member. Um, when I was looking for my first role, um, again, I had someone who was a Morehouse School of Medicine alumni and I attended Morehouse for graduate school she was an MSL and she was kind of mentoring me and she recommended that I go to um, one of their, they have kind of like these training sessions. I think usually they're, they're a couple days long. They focus on how to engage with KOLs, how to present. I, I was just never able to make it to one of those due to work conflicts. Um, she highly recommended them. But again, um, the timing just never lined up to where I was able to do that. And then I got my first role. So I don't have a lot of experience with the society. They're really active on LinkedIn. They do have um, people who in, are in the society who work for um, big pharma, small pharma. So I think it is a good way to engage with people, to network, especially if you're starting from kind of ground zero and building yourself up. I, it could not hurt at all to begin engaging with that society. I think they're the most widely recognized and kind of legit MSL organization that's out there that I've seen. Yeah, they, and from my knowledge, the same thing, Keisha, they're the most, uh, if you want to say reputable MSL organization, they've been around the longest. I remember the founder uh, gave, a pre uh, gave a presentation that I had heard before I ever wanted to be an MSL. Um, but what I'll say is I, I'm not an official member, but I did attend. So last year, the annual conference, they made free to anybody, any and everybody because of the pandemic, because it was all virtual, they made it free. So anybody who was interested got an opportunity. You just had to register and you could have attend. I'm not sure what's, uh, what's going to happen or was that? I don't, I can't even remember when it was, but um, if it's happened this year as yet, but if you get an opportunity, I would say before, if, if at least uh, look into the conference, because I do know a lot of people that have been a part of the society. They have mentoring opportunities as a part of the society. They're very active. And I will admit they 
are genuinely interested in getting you into the field. But what I will say is above all else, what I do view the MS, uh, the MSL Society for is they publish every year a uh, essentially the results from a survey. So at the annual meeting each year, they have thousands of MSLs that attend, but as a part of it, MSLs take a survey. And so it gives idea on like what fields they're in, what they do, people uh, are enough, honest enough to share their pay ranges. So after they've compiled all of this information, they then share it to everybody who participated and it's out there. So it gives you a lot of good information on the types of MSL roles that are out there, the types of salary ranges to expect. If you're a first time MSL, second time MSL, the different types of MSL, you know, um, MSL senior director and all that, and the type of perks or the type of benefits that may come with the job. So above all else, that is a great resource for anybody, if um, if you can uh, view, if if you can get that survey results, because I think that's most prominently what what I um, value, not most what I value them for, but it's definitely um, the benchmark for the field in terms of salary range and how you're doing and that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, and they actually had a really nice report um, during the pandemic of how MSLs were handling the pandemic, how they were engaging and interacting with people. And I know at my company, we kind of leaned on that information as guidance for how we would navigate kind of those tougher months last year as well. So they do, they do produce some really useful data. Thank you for that. So Keisha, earlier you were talking about the importance of attending conferences. So can you briefly tell us about the latest conference you attended and maybe the benefits that, you know, that you got from that? Sure, so the um, it's been a really busy month this month. Um, so I'm in a unique position and this won't be forever, but I'm on a team of two right now. <laughs> and we have three major conferences this month that the two of us are pretty much covering concurrently. So right now we're in the oncology space and we are breaking into the rheumatology space as well. So um, I think Jason probably attended this conference as well, ASCO, so the yeah. American Society of Clinical Oncology Conference, um, one of our biggest conferences of the year. And I'll tell you just really briefly as an MSL how you approach the conference. Um, at my company, we have a number of oncology products. So what we do before we even attend the conference is we'll do pre-conference planning. So I'll look at all the abstracts related to um, products that my company has, and it may be competitor products at another company. And we look at any new data surrounding that, those products. Um, we attend those sessions or we look at those posters. We then extract the most um, important parts of what was presented and we put it together in either a PowerPoint presentation or a report. So we did that for the clinical oncology conference. And then for um, rheumatology, I just attended a conference called ULAR, which is an international conference held in Europe um, for rheumatology. So my focus on that was rheumatoid arthritis and vasculitis, but again, any abstracts, any presentations, any publications surrounding the product that we have in the rheumatology space. And again, you do your pre-conference planning. Usually what you'll do is you'll assign abstracts to different team members. You will tier the abstracts. So what's our top tier? What's the most important? What's the least important? And then you will identify who is presenting at that conference. And you may reach out to them during that conference because that is a potential KOL, right? So, or an HCP. So if somebody, for example, is presenting at ASCO, but they are from Emory, that's in my territory, I may try to leverage the information I got from that presentation they did in an introductory email um, to meet that person because that is a KOL that I'm responsible for in my territory. So conferences are really important just for getting um, insights and information about what's going on in the landscape, but also it's a good way to identify new KOLs or key opinion leaders as well. Thank you, Keisha. Jason, do you have anything to add about conferences? Yeah, so just to touch, I'll keep it about ASCO because essentially if you're in the oncology field, that's the Super Bowl of, for MSLs. So just like you think about the Super Bowl, they have like that week of 
press and preparation and what are you going to do what's the game plan yeah that's what Keisha's is talking about with the pre-planning i was a part of the preparation committee so i was responsible for you know develop looking at all the abstracts and developing what's our strategy but above all that i talked we were launching our first product essentially in asco so we were publishing a whole bunch of data from our company so we also had to know our data but also determine how are we going to leverage this in the rules with kols with individuals in the field and all that stuff but then just like the super bowl after you win you then also have the post media press tour right like you got to go on the this talk show that talk show that's what Keisha's talking about where she's reaching out to kols she's getting involved seeing what they presented finding a ways to uh to like you're you're a lot like a a late show TV host, right? Like you, you got to make people think you like them, you know, uh, that you were interested in what they do or what they yeah. presented so that they give you the good. So they, you know, tell you something they want to work with you or that they just give you some time. So it's a lot like that. But again, because what we're here to do is try to help people. Uh, you heard what we do as MSLs, but a conference like ASCO is just as useful to somebody who wants to be an MSL. The reason for that is, you can treat it like you're already an MSL. You can look and see what's happening. And one of the things that I always tell people um, is, you know, you want to be an MSL and you don't know where to apply or what companies. You're going to get all this information from the news, from press releases. A lot of it is distributed at this conference because essentially it is the Super Bowl for oncology. So if you check the news, it, uh, specifically look for companies that have phase three data that are making the headlines. There's a high chance that they are hiring for MSL positions because what phase three means is that you're getting ready to launch. So you're probably going to be building out an MSL team to do that launch if you haven't already done it. So look at phase three, maybe even some phase two data. If the data is you know, making headlines and it's really good, that's your opportunity to start, even if you don't see public uh, positions for these companies look for what's making the headlines then reach out to people on linkedin that are part of these companies because they may not if they if it's early enough they may not have built the msl team or they may not have started but they will be doing it in the future so get in before they do it right it's like your crystal ball i know who's going to have a position before they ever post it right thank you that's great advice um so lastly oh did you want to say something keisha no i was just going to say it's a great analogy jason that's perfect yeah, yeah. So lastly, what advice do you have for someone interested in being a medical science liaison? I'll let you take this one. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I, I would say persistence is key because um, it's not necessarily going to be easy to break into the role. And I have worked with two um, really great teams so far, but I can tell you each team I started with they tell you right off the bat, it's going to take you about a year to an 18 month to 18 months to really get a hang of what you're doing. And that sounds crazy. And usually if you are a PharmD, if you are a PhD or you are an MD, you have a certain type of personality, right? You want to master something really quickly. You're a really hard worker. You love to learn. So hearing that it will take you a year to learn something Either you don't believe it or it can be a little bit daunting, but it's true because we've touched on a little bit of what we do each day, but it's so hard to communicate to you how rapidly things change and the things that come across our desk and again, how unique it can be from company to company. So I would say stay persistent, even once you get the role, flexibility is key. Again, I am someone who is like Jason, I'm very introverted. Sometimes I can be working on a tunnel on a project and I might have tunnel vision, you know, in my home office by myself and something comes across my desk and I need to pivot and make that a priority instead. And so I think especially as someone who was a previous lab rat who would have my, you know, ear, earphones in and could work by myself all day, you have to be attentive to both the needs internally and externally. So being able to pivot. Um, and, you know, just keep working on your skills, um, your transferable skills. I would say everything I had done up into becoming an MSL was completely useful. Even the most, what seemed like rudimentary tasks in graduate school and undergrad have been useful. 
So your writing skills, um, putting together your dissertation proposal. I can't tell you how many um, written proposals and documents I've had to put together in my role. Building slide decks. I mean, all of these things that quite honestly, sometimes people are impressed by, but for me, it was like routine things in graduate school. And so I wanna also um, kind of leave you with, um, sometimes I think when we come from schools like Clark Atlanta and we're competing against people from other schools, we, we kind of question ourselves, but I can tell you the education you're getting is great. It's preparing you for the world. You can compete out there. Um, you're just as good, if not more qualified than everyone else out there and just stay the course. It, it's not easy for anyone no matter where you're coming from. Um, there's that age old problem of you need experience, but no one will give you experience, but just keep at it. Yeah, so I'll follow up that firstly, C-A-U. Uh, <laughs> secondly, uh, I'm gonna do something. And, and this is where the most basic for anybody starting out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read you my bio. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because this is where you should start. And I'll tell you why. So Dr. JC Carey is a medical science liaison at Grail with experience in the molecular diagnostic oncology field developing biomarkers for clinical research and clinical trial investigation. Dr. Carey earned his BS and PhD from Clark Atlanta University's Cancer Center for Therapeutic Development, characterizing molecular mechanisms of health disparities in prostate cancer. He began his career as a research fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center and spent eight years implementing bench to bedside translational cancer research in his areas of therapeutic drug development and phase one clinical trial protocol investigation. His research has led to various publications and awards, including the Susan G. Coleman Postdoctoral Fellowship. Dr. Carey's research has helped advance the scientific field in the areas of PARP inhibitors, cell cycle inhibitors, biomarker signatures, and genomic profiling as predictors of outcome in cancer patients. As an MSL, Dr. Carey has spearheaded the utilization of whole exome, whole transcriptional molecular profiling, and the implementation of artificial intelligence tools for oncology clinical profiling. Now, I didn't say that to brag. Let me tell you why I said that. I cringe every time that gets said, but that's how I get introduced. That's how either the field team may introduce me or how I was introduced to the current company that I work in. And I cringe because I'm an introvert and I'm like, really? I had to write that. So yes, it's true. But even I don't believe it. But let me tell you, the reason I read that is because I want you to write your profile, do your version of your of your um, bio, because you need to put that put that on your LinkedIn, put it on your resume, because the reason is every time you show up on your job, that's who has to show up. So after I cringe for two or three seconds, I realize to whoever I'm presenting, I have to be that person. So that's why I, I read that to you just now, is because I hate it. I hate it. The introvert in, in me hates having to say all of that or even pretend to be. And when I say pretend, it's not pretending. It's who I am. It's what I do. But, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm chilling with my family, I don't think of myself as that person, right? So your first step, your first goal is to write the most flattering version of you. Give it to somebody to read out and think, would I hire that person? Does this sound like somebody who could do this MSL job? And if it doesn't sound like it, go back to the drawing board and do it again. But within you, there's, there's a version of you in there that you can paint the same way. And I'm sure it will convince somebody that, hey, I want to hire this person. The other thing I'll say is be afraid. When you're applying for MSL position, when you get the job, Keisha said it takes 18 months. Yes, and it's scary. I'll tell you, I left the, I, I spent eight months in my first role and then went to another company. Um, this is where networking comes in. I wasn't looking for the job. I had somebody who left and they had interviewed and say, hey, you may want to try this, this thing out. And um, I came to an entirely, I was very comfortable. I was very good at what I was doing, but this opportunity to be a part of something so new, something, something so revolutionary for the field just was something I couldn't pass up. But I'll tell you what, in my first six months in this job, I was terrified. I doubted myself about every day. I said, did I leave something that I was great at to come to something that I might just be all right at? But you know what that did? That forced me to get better. That forced me. And I was doing something totally I had never done. Quite frankly, I was, you know, I'm trained in, in uh, drugs and therapeutics. This is more in the public health 
version of, of side of things. Like that's a lot of what, what I do now. So I literally had to go back to the drawing board and essentially re-educate myself to be able to present myself as the expert to people. Because when that person shows up, they don't want to hear, oh, I've only been in this for a couple of months or I don't know what I'm doing. Uh-uh, that's out the window. We paying you to be here. Sh- uh, show up and put up. That's all that you get. You And every time you meet someone, you get one chance, right? When you go to that interview, you get one chance, right? There's no tomorrows. It's today. So that's the advice that I have for everyone. Y'all making me so CAU proud right now. <laughs> I'm over here. I'm getting hype. I'm like, okay, y'all motivating me. I'm like, what can I do, you know, in my career right now to, you know, push forward and Thank you guys so much. It's so inspiring, you know, and like Rashida was saying, I didn't really know a whole lot about, you know, MSL. And I, I, I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation where we can talk about it and learn more about it. And I can just see how passionate you guys are about, you know, being an MSL. It just really comes across and, you know, I'm just super proud to see a you right now too. Um, <laughs> like, you know, cause I just feel like when we was there, it was like, we got to do this, you know, find a way or make one, you know, Shout like out to all Dr. of that. Hmm? Yeah. What'd you say? Shout out to Dr. Finkelstein. Dr. Finkelstein. Oh, uh, I, I'm going to tell y'all a story later about Dr. Finkelstein. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was like Dr. Finkelstein was the um, head of the biology department and she just always pushed everyone. Like she used to, I, I used to see her um, around campus and she'd be like, Danielle, when you applying to that program? And I'm like, what program are you talking about? But, you know, she was just very persistent and, and um, I, she was a lovely lady. But yes, you guys have inspired me and I'm, I hope everyone you know, on the call is inspired to, you know, push through and just really present yourself. I would have never guessed that you guys were introverts. That is shocking to me, honestly, <laughs> because yeah. you guys, in the way, you know, you talk about the MSL that never came across. I would definitely think that you guys were so, you know, extroverts and everything like that. But I think it's just very important with some of the things that you guys said, like being flexible, being self-driven, being quick on your feet and being able to have good presentation skills. If you're if, like, when you think about it, the best person that's going to motivate you is yourself. So if you can't, like with you reading your bio, I have a bio on LinkedIn too, where I read and I'm like, cause I had someone help me write it. And I'm like, who is this person that they're talking about? Like, I don't know this person, but you know, that's very true. Like you said, if, if this is what you have on paper and this is how you're being introduced, you have to show up and be this person all the time and you have to be on point. So I think this is excellent advice and we're going to go ahead and dive into questions. If anyone has any questions. Before we dive in, I want to shout out to my mentee, Lauren. She, you know, she just got, uh, she elevated herself. So congrats. Just want to say that's my uh, Black Women in uh, Clinical Research mentee. So just shout out to my mentee. Yes, Jason, thank you for being a mentor. Love it. <laughs> I'm about to say, Keisha, if you want to be a mentor, we, uh, yes, we're, we're looking for you if you want yeah, to. Reach out to me after today's call. Okay. Got it. Definitely. Yeah. And so let's see if we have any questions. And in the meantime, um, if you guys want to drop your LinkedIn so that people can reach out to you. Sure. Should we just put it in the chat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I'm about to say someone's asking, do we have options of a good resume writer? Yes. Black Women in Clinical Research has a resume writer. Go on BWICR.com and click on career services and you can schedule your, yeah. Oh. Andrika's on it. Got it. Thanks, Andrika. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. What other questions? Yes, people are saying thank you guys so much. Um, yep, extremely motivating. I'm trying to see if anyone has any questions. Very insightful. I am not seeing any questions. Did anyone want to come off of uh, mute and ask a question directly? I'll say now is the time. So Don't everybody- be scared. Everybody want to be introverts. Well, uh, not me. I'm one of the. I have a quick question, um, actually. Okay, um, Kofi. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, I'm a fellow in uh, introvert as well. <laughs> it's just it's funny, um, but I had a quick question regarding. So, if you guys could do anything differently, 
or maybe the same, uh, what would you do? That either um, uh, add, add a venture careers or what would you avoid that you did that may have um, set you back in retrospect? Uh, I can take this first. I would say I would believe in myself more. Um, I So unlike Jason, I actually wanted to be an MSL coming out of grad school. And in my opinion, I spent too long in a postdoc um, knowing that I didn't want to pursue a degree in a uh, path in academic research. So Jason mentioned doing it scared. I think, you know, I am one of those people who thinks that everything you do kind of leads you to where you are ultimately. But looking back, I kind of feel like I spent too much time doing something that I knew ultimately wasn't benefiting me and where I wanted to go. And as soon as that postdoc ended, and I'll, I'll tell you just really briefly, long story short, funding ran out. So I was almost kind of booted out of my postdoc unceremoniously, just one of those things with research, right? The money ran out. So I was almost unprepared to be out there, but it was one of the best things that happened to me because it kind of launched my career outside of academia. Um, so I sometimes think about, well, I probably could have made it if I had just taken that leap on my own. But just, you know, just to sum it up, I would say believe in yourself, take chances. As Jason mentioned, do it even if you're scared. Yeah, what I would, um, I, there's nothing I would change. And part of that, the, my process had to happen the way it was. I'm originally from the Bahamas. So I did a lot of my postdoc and training on a visa. So I couldn't just switch to MSL position, especially they're not going to sponsor you for that. So essentially, um, in order to get my green card, I had to like, do publication, show it was worthwhile, essentially to make it. So there's none of that that I would essentially redo. But what I would say is the there are two things that being a part of academia that does us a disservice. And that is that, you know, we, the PIs especially also, oh, you know, industry isn't for you. It's terrible. There's no job stability, blah, blah, blah. Well, we, honestly, there's no job stability in anything. So uh, that's, that's really not a good argument. But the other part is, as a part of that, you know, uh, training or education training, you know, you go through this specialization and you try to get more specialized and more specialized and you try to become this expert on this one protein that nobody else knows nothing about. And that's how you, you know, you write your dissertation on it and you're this ex, you know, but I would say that's a disservice because especially in the MSL role, your ability comes from how broad of a knowledge base you can um, essentially develop and learn and essentially um, re not regurgitate but uh, sim uh, assimilate and become a part of your education to, in, to, to facilitate for other people to learn. So that's why I say, that's one of the things that I say I wish I did better is just becoming more broadly knowledgeable. And, and, and a lot of it is what I talked about today. Learn about companies. You want to be MSL, but do you know the difference between the, uh, a Johnson & Johnson and a Vardis, you know, a Grail in my case? You know, do you know what, what is the innovative science that's going on? Because once you know that broad portfolio of, of everything, you can then say, okay, well, I think I fit in here, or I can do something in here, or this is more applicable to me, or, you know, this way I may be able to, to make my my uh, my role or, or my own um, interest in the field. Can I, can I speak on something that Jason touched on? Um, I was actually thinking about this in preparation for today's talk about how when you're in an academic setting, a lot of times your mentors or your PIs, um, they will tell you that industry is very unstable. Um, you can lose your job at any moment. Um, I have been in a position, my first industry position, we got bought out by another company. I did lose my job. I can tell you before my last day of work, I had at least four interviews lined up. Once you get your foot in the door, you're, you, you can take off. You have opportunities that lay ahead of you. So don't let that scare you. And then I think if anything, 2020 showed us that life is unpredictable, right? So a whole pandemic hit, and I can tell you my graduate school is struggling because how do you train students to do research when there's a global pandemic? So those professors who are in academia, to be quite honest, their jobs were in jeopardy last year. Whereas 
I'm in industry and I was able to do my job completely virtually. So a lot of times I don't think it's, um, I don't think they have ill intent in trying to scare you in industry. I think they're legitimately just not knowledgeable. And so don't let any of that rhetoric kind of deter you if you've determined that this is what you wanna do. Thank you. Uh, Sierra. You had your hand up. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, having this great event. Um, I'm curious. I had a couple. I'm starting to apply and I've been doing all right over the phone, but I guess I wanted to know what was your toughest interview questions and then about your presentation. Like I had one coming up. What was probably the most important things that they asked you or something that I would need to look look um, forward to preparing for? Thank you. Uh, before uh, before I get into that, I, I see a question say, because I talked a little bit about the different degrees. I see uh, something that says, can other healthcare providers like NP and PA? I do think there are opportunities for, especially, you know, physician's assistant, you know, especially if you have a, a degree where you have a, a clinical experience there, there, nothing is closed door. So as long as you can sell yourself, that's an opportunity. Um, but to your question, like what's the hardest question in the, and uh, how do you, essentially, how do you prepare for the interviews? Uh, what is the hardest question? I think anything that really requires me to open up about myself is, is hard for me personally. But in terms of preparing for the interview, um, I touched on this. I said, when you prepare for that interview, make them think that you're already MSL just without the title. So do everything in your power to paint yourself in that aspect. In terms of presenting, that's uh, the specific presentation you have to do. That can be anything. It will change by different companies. So I honestly, I can't tell you the specific way. In fact, I did something in my interview that was probably the biggest gamble where if you have an opportunity to present something about the company or not about the company, most people say, take the safe route and don't present about the company because they're the experts of the company. And essentially, if you present something about the company, they're gonna judge you harder than, than something that where they have no expertise in. When I did my interview, I not only presented about the company, but I also presented about like, you know, my ideas of what they should be doing. It was a gamble, but the reason it worked was because I had researched the field so well and I knew the field so well, I kind of guessed the areas they were headed with next products and so in my interview they, they were they're like wondering did somebody tip me off but the fact that i could see the potential of the technology that shows that essentially we should hire this guy because he's already figured it out without us ever telling anybody what our next steps are yeah and sierra for me the hardest part of the interviews um especially early on uh, wasn't so much the questions that they were asking me, but it was understanding the way that industry likes to communicate. So there's a lot of pharmacology, the way they speak about their, their data is different than us as academic scientists. So it was difficult to learn their jargon, again, to learn acronyms, um, to just kind of make myself seem like I was part of that world. Because again, you do have to present yourself um, very much in that way. So I would say that was the most difficult aspect of um, interviewing. And, I, and one thing I forgot to, to say is that, so people will come to me and they'll be like, okay, I'm getting stuff. None of my, I'm getting no callbacks from submitting resumes or I'm having the HR screen and then I'm not, and I'm not moving to on. So in the overall process, here's the process. You submit resume, but you should also be networking while submitting resumes, but you're doing that. Next step is you get a callback from a hiring manager um, sorry, you get a call back from HR. HR puts you forward to a hiring manager. And then if a hiring manager likes you, you probably interview one or two people before a panel interview. So typically, and I've gotten a couple different uh, MSL offers. So your typical MSL role is probably going to be about five interviews slash interactions. So it's not a simple fix. And every interview every time you speak to somebody that's an opportunity for you to not get hired and the other part is if you make it to that final stage here's the thing don't settle for being good and i'm not even telling you settle for being great settle for standing out and the reason i say that is people often think okay i did this i got all the way here and i didn't get the job 
quite frankly, they're only hiring most of the time one person. And you don't, you could do everything good and still not get the job because somebody else did better. So every time I go into interview, I think about, okay, somebody who has the same qualifications for me is going to come and interview this job. How do I make myself stand out? What is different about me? And that's typically not it's not in your resume. It's a little bit more, how do you think? How, like, what have you, do, like, what have you shown that you've learned about the company? Like, it's, it's more about the you. And um, I'll give you one of my secret sauce when I interview. I try to ask a question that will make that hiring manager or that individual remember me. And I'll, and I'll tell you, for my current job, what I did was I went to my, uh, that person's LinkedIn and, I'm, and I saw it on there and they had that they played rugby. And so I figured, you know, we had a great interview and she's like, any more questions? And I'm like, you know what? I looked at your uh, LinkedIn and I just had one really pressing question. I said, uh, I saw that you played rugby and I was always curious, people who play rugby, do you like American football? It had nothing to do with science, nothing to do with nothing. And she opened up to self, she opened up a little bit about herself. But what that did was that made her see me as not just a candidate, but somebody she wanted to talk to about herself. And so that's, and so I think that's an example of how you can make yourself stand up because at the end of the day, to be an MSL, you're going to work in the team. So introvert or not, you got to be able to show you're easy enough to work with. Yeah. And just to touch on um, interviewing, because that, ooh, that is a, quite a process. Jason said you can have as many as five interviews for one role. Um, the feedback I got from my current um, manager and the people who interviewed me, they said, you interviewed us more than we interviewed you. So that goes back to preparation, right? You got to know everything about the company when you're coming in, learn as much about the product. Um, it goes beyond just being an MSL. And if you've had work experience, you may know what you don't, what type of team you don't want to work with, what type of manager you don't want to work with. So you got to interview them to see if this is a space you want to work in, if this is a manager you want to work under. Because again, it is a lot of territory management, self-management, but it is very collaborative from day to day as well. So my advice is interview them as much as they're interviewing you. All right, thank you guys. So unfortunately we have time for one more question. Uh, Jay Black, if you want to. Hi, um, I'm a pharmacy student and I'm, I know it's really hard to get that first role. Is there something that you would recommend like applying to like medical affairs, like anything in industry that you would consider more of an entry role that might be good to apply to start? Yeah. There are, that's awesome. there, there are a lot of rules out there and, and the way I view those is, do you think of them as uh, stepping stone rules to MSL? Anything that makes you look like an MSL. So, you know, it can be field application scientists that's more for PhDs, but that's typically not, that's particularly like in the molecular device area where they have, it's essentially an MSL role, but just uh, in, in the more molecular device type of way. So that's a good one. But anything that shows that you're an educator, communicator. So if it's a part of the communication, if it's something in medical affairs, definitely the, all of those are beneficial. Um, if it's something that works with pharma or works with clinical trials, anything along those lines uh, are good stepping stones that get you to that next step. Yeah, so I'm actually um, looking up a program. So when I was a postdoc, I per participated in a program um, and I can send the information to Danielle. It's called SMDP and it's geared towards minority students. And what they do is they introduce minority students, so it can be PhD or postdoc, to um, careers in industry. So it's kind of like conference slash seminar style, and they set you up with an industry mentor for a year. And I always get emails about it. They're always looking for people to recruit. And usually they're looking for people on like the true pharma side and then the biotech side as well. But I would say any program like that where you can interface with industry, whether it be some sort of like um, internship. I know sometimes if you're in a PhD program, your PI is hesitant to let you do that, but you really have to advocate for yourself and push for these types of opportunities. Um, but when I was a postdoc in particular, I would apply to all sorts of, you know, industry centered um, opportunities like this. 
and I would get them and I would have the opportunity to meet with people. And I've had people from those programs reach out to recruiters internally at their company and get me interviews. So if you can do some sort of internship, and again, Danielle, I will get you that information on that specific program that I participated in. All right, sounds good. Thank you guys so much. I saved the chat. So if we want to go, well, we're going to, we're going to um, see if uh, Dr. Carey and Dr. Scarlett can answer any of the questions. So we can post that. Um, and also you guys have their LinkedIn information. Feel free to reach out them out to them to if you have any further questions. But thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Thank you, Dr. Carey. I gotta make sure I put that doctor in front of it. Give y'all y'all props. And <laughs> I'm about to say, um, you guys did amazing. Thank you to Rashida and Andrika, like my I don't know. We're going to call us ourselves the dream team. I don't know. But yes, um, the, <laughs> the three amigos. Uh, but yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. This was awesome. Thank you. And Thanks, I, I just, oh, yeah. And I just want to say thank you, guys. Uh, sorry, guys, isn't appropriate. Thank the, the, you ladies for having us tonight. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. But the one thing I want to say is that, again, I'll touch on it. I said, I view luck as equal parts opportunity and preparation. So that's the one thing that I'd say going away. And then the other part is I already see people hitting me up on LinkedIn. It's uh, I'm off tomorrow for June thing. So if I don't, uh, if you don't hear from me from a while, don't be discouraged. It's June thing. I'm off. I'm done. So uh, I'll see y'all on Monday. <laughs> right. I understand. I'm like, don't send me no emails. It's June thing. I got you. I, we get it. But yes. Um, uh, Dr. Scarlett, did you want to say any last words? Yeah, again, thank you for having me. You guys have been super engaging. Um, I love connecting with people from CAU. So this has been a wonderful way to spend my evening. And I want to send a special shout out to L, who is in my postdoc lab because he just um, graduated and got his PhD. So congratulations again, L. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.